And then once you've got a Bible, you can open up to Deuteronomy chapter 28. That's where we will be this morning. It is a long chapter. We will not read every verse in it, uh, but we uh, will read many of them uh, because there are some, some really good content in here, things that we really need to take heart. We need to remember the things that are in here, as always, right? We always want to remember what we hear, what we read, uh, but maybe a little bit more so this morning. Deuteronomy 28 is broken up, or at least the way that I see it, broken up into two main divisions for those of you that take notes or those of you that take mental notes. We will see in verses 1 through 14, the first 14 verses, the promise of blessing, promise of blessing, the remaining verses, verses 15 to 68, which is a larger portion than that first one, uh, we are calling promise of cursing. So, uh, you know, what, what, a, what a, uh, you know, what are we talking about here? So is it a promise of blessing or is it a promise of cursing? Well, as you will see, it's either or. It's up to you. It's up to the people. And we'll make some application for us for today. Deuteronomy 28 Verses 1 through 14, the promise of blessing, it begins here in the first six verses with a pronouncement. It's just a general pronouncement. Now, what the writer does here, what Moses is doing is, he is giving this general pronouncement, and then he will spend the rest of that time down to verse 14, from verses 7 to 14, getting into some specifics. So what about this promise of blessing? Well, the first thing that jumps out at us, verse 1, it says, Now it shall come to pass. And there's a little two-letter word there. And if you're the kind of person that likes to mark your Bible, write in there, whatever, make notes, you will notice the, the little two-letter word, if, I-F, if. Uh, on that two-letter word hangs much. There's much there. What does that indicate for us? It indicates immediately that what we are about to read, uh, uh, read or learn about is conditional. If it is like you asking your parents, "Can I please go to the mall on Sunday afternoons with my friend?" Sunday afternoon with my friends, and your parent says to you, "Yes, you can go if you get fill in the space, you know, fill in the blank, whatever done. If you get your homework done." if you get your room cleaned, if you get the dishes done, if you get the whatever. It's conditional. Yes, you can go if you do this. So same thing here. As we get into this section on the promise of blessing, it is conditional. Now, we tend to think, well, I mean, I thought that when we were gods, he just blesses us automatically. Well, in fact, he does. Okay? In fact, he does. Even when we're being disciplined, it's still a blessing from the God, and we'll talk uh, from, from God, and we will talk some more about that when we get into our second section. But here, this is conditional. Now, notice he gives us the conditions first. Now, it shall come to pass in verse one if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. It's very clear there. If you diligently obey the voice of the Lord, diligently that means consistently. It means you make a commitment to be diligent at something is like going to baseball practice every day. You're diligent in doing that, so you're getting better at it. Here, if you diligently obey the voice, if it's an ongoing commitment that you have made to obey the voice of the Lord your God, how? To observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, Moses says. If you do those things, at the end of verse 1, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. So immediately it's clear, Moses is making it clear that if you will be obedient, that you are going to be high above. You're going to be number one. You're going to be special. You're going to be blessed. And it gets a little bit more specific in the following verses. Verse two, and all these blessings, and I love this, shall come upon you and overtake you. So this, this uh, uh, chapter is all about being overtaken. And what he's saying in this chapter is you're either going to be overtaken in blessing if you are obedient to the Lord, 
or you will be overtaken in cursing if you are disobedient. We'll get to that part later. But here in verse 2, all of these blessings shall come upon you. What, what blessings? Well, he's going to give us a list here in just a moment. But all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. So immediately there is this condition set, set and there is a principle set. And we've been learning a lot about principles, biblical principles, seeing the way that God works. Here's another one. What you and I need to understand is the blessing and the cursing is conditional. It depends on what we've just been told. It depends on their actions. If their actions, if the people, if they live in such a way that they are obedient to the Lord, he's not asking for perfection. I mean, I guess he is in a sense, but he knows that his people cannot be perfect. But he wants for them to be committed to him, to strive to please him. If he sees that, then he's going to overtake them with blessings. That is the picture, overtaken in blessings. That's the picture of God forcing your mouth open and stuffing you with blessings. It's just, you're, 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 there's going to be so many of them, you're just not going to be able to handle it. It's like if I had three legs, I still couldn't stand it. It's, it's, it's God, he's going to overwhelm you with blessing if you're obedient, if you're obedient. And, and again, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God, but there's this principle set. And the principle carries on over into the New Testament for you and I. It's the same principle, that if I live in obedience to the Lord, I'm going to experience his blessing. If I live in disobedience to the Lord, then I experience his, in this case, it's called cursing. We would call it discipline, okay? But do not make this mistake, okay? Here's a, here's a common mistake. People read through this and they go, okay, so if I'm obedient, then God loves me. And if I'm disobedient, God hates me. Well, that is absolutely not saying that here at all. That's, that's, it doesn't say that anywhere here in this chapter. The people that are being spoken to in this case, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, they are God's people. They're the Israelites. There's, there's nothing you can do about that. They are God's people. And what God is not telling them here is, if you are disobedient, you know, if you're, if you're obedient, you get to be my people, and if you're disobedient, then you're no longer my people. That's not what he's saying. They will always be his people. There's no, there's no withdrawing that. There's something else that is unconditional. The, 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 the land allotment. They're getting the land. God already promised you're getting the land. You're going into the land. You're getting that land. But the amount of time that you spend in that land, in other words, the length of stay in that land, depends on your obedience or disobedience. So that's conditional. So the land is, the, his love is unconditional. The land, unconditional. The love cannot be changed. The amount of time that they spend in the land before they're attacked and taken away, that's conditional. That depends on their obedience to the Lord. But they will never cease to be God's people. Same thing for you and I. Romans chapter 8 tells us that nothing can separate us from the love of God that we have in Jesus. Nothing. So you and I are not in danger at all. Even as we read through this chapter and make application, I'm never going to tell you, the chapter is not saying, the Bible never says, that you are in danger of losing your salvation if you're disobedient. It does not say that. It doesn't teach that. But there certainly is discipline if I'm living in disobedience. And so that's what this chapter is about, laying out that principle for them. And he makes it very clear from the beginning, if you diligently obey then man, I'm going to overtake you. I'm going to open your mouth. I'm going to be stuffing blessings in. You're just going to, there's going to be so much blessing. And what he's going to do is he's going to tell us what many of those blessings are. Now, what he does here in verses 3, 4, 5, and 6 is he gives us this little, this little poetical section here. Blessed shall you be. This is like the ble be attitudes here. You know, blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the country. All, all of us out here in the fee, that's, that's amazing to us. Because we think of San Diego. San Diego is still pretty nice. We like San Diego. But LA, right? There's like, there's, everybody there is demonic and there's vampires and everybody there is evil and sinful. There are actually some thrive, good, solid, thriving Christian churches in LA. 
probably a bunch. I only know of one or two, but there actually are Christians in L.A. I don't know if you knew that or not. It's pretty incredible. But we normally see L.A. as like, oh, no, man, that's the city, man. That's... And God is telling them, this is quite surprising. He says, you'll be, you're, if you obey, he says, you'll be blessed in the city and you'll be blessed in the country. God's saying, I, I bless you anywhere. He goes on in verse four to say, blessed shall be the fruit of your body. The fruit of my body, yes. Your offspring, your children, they're going to be blessed. You're going to have lots of them and they're going to be good. Verse three, uh, verse four rather, the produce of your ground and the increase of your herds the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks, everything. There's just going to be babies everywhere. Humans, animals, there's just going to be babies. The land's going to be full. It's going to be good. Verse 5, there's another, you know, if, if they're obedient, verse 5, blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Your basket, what is that all about? Like, you know, think of it in terms of a shopping basket, shopping cart. You know, you go and you fill that thing up with all kinds of goodness. I had to run to the store last night, uh, smart and uh, final, uh, fart and smile, whatever it's called. And, you know, you go in and there was, I was walking up and I had just a few items, emergency items, you know, that I, I had to run to the store late last night. And then, so I, I, I'm coming up to the line. There's only one line open. And there's a dude there with a full basket. I mean, just full. And he looked at me and he gave me the, it's like, Go ahead and get in front of me. He was just starting to unload his basket, and I was just praying, like, Lord, just change this man's mind. You know, and he, he, uh, he, he gave me the nod. He's like, yeah, go ahead and go in front of me. And I got in front, you know, paid for my few little things. But that's the idea. You know, you got a basket that's just full of stuff. That's what he's talking about here. Your basket is just going to be full of whatever you need. And your kneading bowl, kneading, that's kneading dough, okay? In other words, you're, you're just always going to have all the bread that you need. You like bread? I like, who likes bread? I love bread. When I was younger, I haven't done this in a lot of years, but when I was younger, you know, when you're real hungry, you've been out, you know, when you're a little kid, you've been outside playing or whatever, and you come inside and you're just starving. And it's, who's got time for a hot pocket, right? So grab a piece of bread and I would do this. I would tear off the end. I like the ends, but I would tear off the ends. I would ball it up real tight and just bite it like that. Okay. Anybody do that? Anybody? Okay. Godly people right here. Once in a while, I would do that. I would actually take the bread spread too much butter on it, and then ball it up real tight and then eat it. And then you get the bread and then you get all that butter in there. And it was just probably terrible for me. It's the reason I have high cholesterol now, but it was good back then. But he's saying that you'll have all the bread you need, man. I love bread, okay? Love bread. You're gonna have everything that you need. Verse six, blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. Just every, everywhere you go, you're just gonna be blessed. Now, he gets a little more specific. Verse 7, for those of you that take notes, he says, I'm going to bless you with protection. Verse 7, the Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. They're going to come against you, but they're going to go running away from you in seven different ways, every, every which way. Then he tells them in verse 8, I'll bless you with provision, provision. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses. So they'll have, you know, two refrigerators. And in all to which you set your hand, everything you do is going to be blessed. And he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God has given you. He's going to provide. Then he tells them in verses 9 and 10 that he's going to bless them with position. What about position? Verses 9 and 10. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself. Notice that position. God is going to, always, going to establish you as holy people, sanctified, set apart for him, for himself. That's a good position to be God's, to be close to him. That's what we need, right? Too often, too often, we think of ter in terms of how far away from the Lord can I get and still be a good Christian? So I want to be like, I want to be a good Christian, but I want to be like one of those edgy Christians, man. Like I want to live on the edge, like, you know, kind of flirt with the world a little bit. And he's saying, listen, if you're obedient, he'll give you this special place. You'll be with him. You'll be his. Verse 9, just as he has sworn to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. So 
Then all peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be, be afraid of you. Now, we, we, we can oftentimes experience this same type of blessing in our own lives. I really, you know, without any shame, I can tell you that I live in a bubble. Um, I, generally speaking, go from my house to the church. I, I actually work at the church. I, I, I actually am, 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 am an employee of the church, and, and they pay me. This is my only job. Somebody just asked me the other day, Hey, so, uh, so, so you're a pastor. Yeah. So do you like, like, do you, like, is that your only job? I was at the chiropractor and, and the, the receptionist asked me, is that like your only job? Yeah, that's all I do. Really? So what do you, like, what do you do all week? Play video games? I don't know. Like, no, I'm just kidding. I, I was like, well, you know, I, I got lots of things that I do and this, you know, this and that and the other, but, but it was just funny. It's like, what, what, are, you, what, are, you, what are you talking about? You know, you work at the church. Yeah, I, work, I work at the church. What I do. But, but here, um, I, I'm telling you that I live in a bubble because you guys might experience this more often. Um, I remember it because I didn't always work at a church, but um, you, might, you might be out in public somewhere. It might be school, it might be a team, it might be a dance class, it might be whatever it is. And you might, it might be that people notice that there's something different about you. And they know you're not perfect, but they know that you're a Christian. And what can happen oftentimes is, is that you might have some people that find out you're a Christian and then you're like, no, 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 I don't want to see that video. Don't, I don't, I don't want to watch that stuff. And then, you know, they make fun of you. Oh, you know, ah, whatever. Okay. You know, Christian, you know, you think you're Jesus, whatever. You know, they, you know, they, they want to bag on you. But then what I've seen happen oftentimes is that later on, those same people, when their life is falling apart, when mom just found out she had cancer, when dad's leaving, when grandma's sick, they're looking for you. And they're going, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? You know, and they want to talk privately because they don't want nobody knowing that they're talking to the Christian, you know. And they're like, hey, could you just do me a favor? You know, I know you're like, you're like into God and stuff, you know. Could you, could you pray for me? Could you pray for my family member or whatever? And they're coming back to you. That's the idea here is that God would give you that good position because you're, you're just, man, I'm just living with the Lord. I'm just, I just love the Lord. And you hold fast to that. You just go, you know what? Whatever. You can make fun of me if you want, but I love the Lord. And you're going to find that you're going to find, you're going to have that good position established where people are going to come back and they're going to go, hey, uh, you know, you 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 seem like you like you're a you know, genuine Christian. You know, could you could you do this for me? That's the idea there. He tells them in verses 11 and 12 that he will bless them with their production, and the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, which you mentioned before, but kids in the increase of your livestock and in the produce of your ground and the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. I love this in verse 12. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens. Tells us what his good treasure is. He'll open to you his good treasure, the heavens. For what? To give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. So he's going to bless their land with rain so that their crops grow. He'll even bless them financially so that they are lending money to other countries, but they don't have to borrow because they've got enough. He tells them that he will bless them by way of promotion in verses 13 and 14 to round out this section. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not beneath. If you heed the commandments, there it is again, of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and are careful to observe them, so you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I command you this day, to the right or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. He says, I'll bless you. If you don't don't stray off worshiping other gods, these idols, you just keep your eyes on me, you live in obedience to me, and I, I'll, I'll bless everything you do. I'll even make you the head and not the tail. You'll, you'll be above only and not beneath. You'll be, the, you'll be the head honcho, big cheese, big boss, queen bee, whatever it is you want to call it, la barriga, the big, the big boss, man, boom. He's telling them, I, I will promote you if you live in obedience. Now, this is, this is incredible. We finish this section, and we'll get into the next section, and we will, will not read all of the verses you notice that it goes down to verse 68, and you're like, wait a minute, we're not, we're, how many verses? 
We will not be reading all of them, but we will read some good chunks of them because I really need for you all to leave here with something burned into the recesses of your brain, into the folds of your gray matter. I need for you to leave understanding this principle, but we'll get to that in just a minute. But I love this. He's saying, if you're obedient, you do what I'm telling you to do, you're going to be blessed. Now, it's a, it's a biblical principle, but it's, it's a principle that we see just in society in general. If you behave yourself and do what you're supposed to do, generally speaking, you're going to have a good life. Okay? If you, some of you are driving now, which scares me to death, okay? But if you get out onto Scott Road and you're driving, as long as you follow the rules and stay on your side of the road, I've seen some of you drive. Stay on your side of this, the right side, in case you didn't know, okay? Stay on your side of the road, generally speaking, you're going to be blessed, okay? Stop at the red lights, you know, those types of things. When you decide that, pff, nobody tells me what to do, I do what I want to do, and I feel like driving on the left-hand side, okay? I, feel like, I just feel like being a foreigner, let me go on the left-hand side. And you go and drive on the left-hand side, what's going to happen? Crash. Right? You're going to get yourself into trouble. So it's a basic principle even throughout society. But with God, he's telling his people, here's the amazing thing. This is the incredible thing to me. He's, he's been going on. I mean, we're in chapter 28 of Deuteronomy. All 28 chapters. You can go back to the previous. You can go back to Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. What has he been doing all of this time? He's been telling him his law over and over and over and over and over again explaining to them, do this, do this, do this, do this. This is how you do this. This is how you do this. This is how you do this. How you, how you do this. We've been reading it. Some of you have been here for all of it. And he tells them, I've laid it all out for you. I've told you how to do everything. I've even taught you how to wash your pots. I've taught you how to be clean in the kitchen. Everything, everything that you can think of. Here it is. Do it. And then I will bless you so much. You'll, you'll just be, you'll be choking up blessings, he tells them. You'll be overtaken in blessings. So here it is. Do that. And, and, and you're just going to, you're going to be blessed in every area of your life. And then in verse 15, there's this little three-letter word. These little words in this chapter. The first one was if. Now, here's verse 15. Everything is going fantastic. And then the word but shows up. Everything was going so good. And now verse 15, but. I don't, I don't, I don't even want to know what's on the other side of that but. I just, why can't we just stay here in the blessing part? I'll tell you why we cannot stay in the blessing part and we move on to the promise of cursing. Why would we do that? Why would we do that? Because what God is doing is he's issuing a warning to his people. He is saying, listen, here, it's all laid out for you. If you're obedient to what I've been telling you to do, I'm going to bless your socks off, man. But if you're disobedient, then it's cursing. Okay? And so that's what he's going to talk about now. And so he says in verse 15, or actually verses 15 down to 19, starts the same way. There's this pronouncement, verses 15 through 19. You're gonna, it's going to sound a lot like where we started back in verses 1 through 4. He says this, but it shall come to pass if you do not obey, if, there's the condition. So it's a choice, free will, folks. If you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you to do today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Verse 16, cursed shall you be in the city and cursed shall you be in the country. Verse 17, cursed shall you be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Cursed shall you be when you come in and cursed shall you be when you go out. There it is. If you're disobedient, then it's cursing. Now, this might drive you crazy. It drove me crazy. Um, last night, I literally went crazy. Lost my mind and gathered a little bit of it back for this morning. 
Um, verses 20 through 68, I know that's a big chunk. And I'm, I'm speaking really to those of you that are the note takers, because I know a lot of, you know, I see some of you, you're like writing down the, 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 the main points and the sub points and stuff. And, and so this is the last of the points. Now you go, well, why is it so big? The punishment part verses 20 to 68. And that is because the, the first 14 verses, they just flowed nicely. They were kind of broken up real neatly. And well, he's going to, you know, there's a promise of provision here. It's real plain to see. And there's a promise of protection here. It's real easy to see. But in these verses, it doesn't flow as easily. And I was trying to find all the little sections and I was driving myself mad doing it uh, because it was like, well, I don't know. This doesn't really, this is not really flowing. And, uh, and, and so I decided, you know what? Get rid of all those little other little points and just simplify it. Now, it's, it's plain, for those of you that like to take notes, it's real easy as we go through, you can you know, jot down notes. I'm just telling you that I don't have any other sub points in there to make this you know, any neater, but that's okay. Now, in verse 20 is where the punishment begins. From verses 20 to 24, he uses two words two times. The word destroyed, you see it in verse 20, and perish. He uses the word perish again in verse 22, and he uses the word destroyed in verse 24. It's important that you and I understand this. Well, look what it says in verse 20, because this is, this is a little bit confusing. The Lord will send on you, this is if they're disobedient. If you're disobedient, the Lord will send on you cursing, confusion, and rebuke. It's a strong correction in all that you send your hand to do. Until you are destroyed, and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings in which you have forsaken me. Now, I just want to, for a moment, point out that when he says, if you're disobedient, I'm going to destroy you until you die quickly. Again, he's not saying that if you're disobedient, that you'll no longer be my children and I'm just going to kill you. That's not what he's saying. What he is saying is, if you're disobedient, you'll still be my children and I will kill you. Now you might go, I don't know, that doesn't sound very comforting to me at all. It doesn't. But to know that in the end, the people are still his people, that's important. Why is that important? It's important for you and I, the same biblical principle applies. And that is that you and I are never going to stop being his people. I do not, at least, some of you, there may be somebody in here who does, but I do not believe that you can lose your salvation. I believe that once you have surrendered your life to the Lord, that your life is the Lord's, and it's not going to be lost. And I know there's all kinds of questions. Well, what if the person is you know, really disobedient, and they just go off, and they do all these other things? And you know, I've, I've got answers that I think are satisfying, and I can share those with you later on. I'm not going to do that now, but, but I believe that, that once you have salvation, it's, it's your possession, and God's not going to take that away from you. However... I do believe in the New Testament, we're even told this, where Paul, once he, he told the church, he's like, hey, if the person is, you know, if they're sinning, kick them out. Allow Satan to beat them up so that maybe they'll lose their life physically, but their soul will be saved. So the principle being that even a believer can get into that place where they're disobedient and they're fighting against the Lord and the Lord can, in his discipline, if the person continues to put up a fight, the Lord could even cause that person, he could snatch the life out of that person if he wants to in order to end their disobedience. So I believe that there is that danger. I believe that the New Testament even talks about that, about this same type of thing. So not that we would be destroyed or perish and go to hell if we're, if we're saved. But that we might, you know, it's, it's called a saved soul, but a wasted life. There are some Christians that are like that. You know, on, they're Christian, but on their deathbed, man, they got nothing but regret. Wasted time. Because they gave their life to the Lord, and then they spent the rest of their life trying to take their life back and putting up, you know, in, their, in a tug of war with God. And you're just never going to win. Never going to win. But I do not believe that you can lose your salvation or lose your 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 position with the Lord. In other words, the, the fact that I belong to the Lord. But he begins to talk about this punishment. Um, he's, he's naming all kinds of things. Verse 23, he says, and your heavens, which are over your head. Remember, he had previously said, I'll oh, bless your heavens, man, and you'll, it'll rain. He says, but if you're disobedient, 
Your heavens, which are over your head, shall be bronze, and the earth, which is under you, shall be iron. What's he talking about? talking about what they really turn bronze no what he's saying is he's going to squeeze you out man the skies will dry up bronze doesn't let off rain he's saying that the rain will dry up and that life will become heavy and burdensome and that you'll be squeezed in between and you and i have experienced that before in those times where we're living in disobedience to the lord and maybe maybe we lied to our mom or to our dad or maybe we lied to a teacher or we've gotten in some kind of trouble. We've gotten ourselves in some kind of bad position and you've sensed the heaviness of that. You're trying to lay down at night in your bed and go to sleep, but you've got no peace and you just feel like your brain is being squeezed out of your skull and you feel the pressure of it in your chest and you just feel like, man, like, gosh, I, I, I got to stop this. That's what he's talking about. He's saying you, if you're disobedient, I'm going to turn the sky to bronze, man, and the earth under you will be iron and you'll be squeezed. Verse 24, the Lord will change the rain of your land to powder and dust. From the heaven it shall come down on you until you are destroyed. Here's the next thing in verses 25 and 26. He says, if you're disobedient, you'll be defeated. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. The tables are turned. Verse 26, your carcasses shall be food for all the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and no one shall frighten them away. They'll just be left out there to die and eaten by animals. Verses 27 through 29, even their, their uh, health is cursed. The Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt. The boils of Egypt. With tumors. With the scab. And I hate this one. With the itch. From which you cannot be healed. Isn't that horrible when you got that itch like on that spot on your back and you just can't reach it? And you're like bending, like, oh, you know, you're trying to grab it. And then you're looking for something to scratch your back. You can't find anything. And, you know, you go and find a wall and the wall's not rough enough. And you're like, ah, oh, you know, and you just feel like you're going to go crazy. He says, well, you'll, you'll, he says, your health will be stricken. Verse 28, the Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of heart. That's what happens when we're living in disobedience to the Lord. We, we, we lose our, 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 our sense. Start making foolish decisions. He describes them in verse 29. You shall grope at noonday as a blind man gropes in darkness. You're just going to be like a blind person. Even in the middle of the day when, there's, when, the, when the light is the highest, you're just going to be like a blind person all over the place. And I've seen Christians like this attempting to, to live their own life apart from the Lord even though they've already given their life to the Lord, but now they're trying to do their own thing and confusion reigns in their life. Chaos, man. They don't know where they're going and what does the Lord want for my life? And, and I, don't know, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Well, you've got you to sit at the feet of the Lord, man. You've got you to calm yourself down. You're, 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 you're trying to do all kinds of other things. Just be in fellowship with the Lord. The Lord will lead you. you know, he'll, he'll tell you where to go. Verse 30. You shall betroth the wife. You're going to marry a wife, but another man will have her. You'll build a house, but you won't be able to live in it. You'll plant a vineyard, but you won't be able to eat its, its grapes. Your ox will be slaughtered before you, and you shall, but, but you're not going to be able to eat it. Your donkey shall be violently taken away from before you. Imagine that. Wake up in the morning, you look out, and your donkey's gone. That's how you know the Lord's against you. He's gone. We laugh about that because obviously we're not dependent on donkeys, but they certainly were. And for them, that would be like, hey, your, your, your work machinery, your farming machinery, your tools are gone. You got nothing. How, how are you going to plow the fields? How are you going to work the land? You're not going to be able to. Not the donkey. Your sheep will be given to enemies. You shall have no one to rescue them. Verse 32. Your sons and your daughters shall be given to other, another people. And your eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all day long. And there shall be no strength in your hand. Your kids are, your kids are going to be taken away if you're disobedient. This is all if they're disobedient. A nation whom you, whom you have not known shall eat the fruit of your land and the produce of your labor. And you shall be only oppressed and crushed continually. Verse 34, you shall be driven mad because of the sight which your eyes see. 
2 Kings chapter 25, there was a king named Zedekiah. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had come against Jerusalem. And the people were besieged. That means that they were trapped in their own city. The food supply ran out. And through a hole in the wall, the king, Zedekiah, and his men split in the middle of the night. Cowards. They were trying to get away from the Babylonians, and the Babylonians caught them. They brought Zedekiah and his sons. And they murdered his sons in front of him. And then immediately after murdering his sons, they gouged his eyes out. So that the last thing that he ever saw on the face of this earth was his sons being murdered. And he would have to sleep knowing that, try to sleep, knowing that his sons were killed because he tried to make his escape, trying to save himself. The things that are in here, in this section, the promise of cursing, are given as a what if. It's conditional. You know what? You people, he's telling these people, if you're, if you're disobedient, man, all this stuff's going to come upon you. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. They didn't know it at that point. Moses probably knew. God certainly knew. We know in hindsight because we're looking back. The people, they would be obedient for a short time. And then they would become disobedient. And they would eventually experience all of this cursing. So as God is, you know, as Moses is sharing these things, as God is sharing through Moses to the people, it's a what if, it's conditional. Listen, if, you, if you're obedient... I'm, I'm going to be stuffing blessings down your throat. But if you're disobedient, I'm going to be stuffing curses down your throat. But God knew that the people were going to be disobedient and that all of these things were going to come upon them, that God was going to cause all of these things to come upon them. And, and they did. They did. It doesn't stop there. It gets even more gruesome. Verse 38, you shall carry much seed out to the field, but gather little in for the locusts shall consume it. Notice this pestilence now. Verse 39, there's going to be worms that eat the crops. Verse 40, you'll have olive trees, olive trees, but all of the olives are just going to drop off. They'll be no good. You'll have sons and daughters in verse 41, but they won't be yours. They're going to be taken slaves. Verse 42, there's going to be locusts, again, pestilence. Verse 43, aliens from Mars are going to come. Who, no, there are no aliens coming off of Mars. He's talking about foreigners, foreign people. He says, the alien who is among you, so there were foreign people, foreigners living with them. The alien who is among you shall rise higher and higher above you, and you shall come down lower and lower. That's what happens when we disobey God. We don't evolve into something greater, something better. We devolve. We get worse. He says, the alien, in verse 44, will lend to you, but you shall not lend to him. He shall be the head, and you shall be the tail. So the tables will be turned. You say, but I don't want that. I know. So the people just needed to choose obedience. Sounds simple, right? Sounds easy. Verse 47, as we skip down a little bit. Because you did not serve the Lord your God. Here's what God wants. Service with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything. Now this is key. This is key. This is key. It's key because of this. Because there are still individuals who today are not serving the Lord with God, or serving the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything. And I have seen it. After some almost 30 years of ministry, I've seen it. Year after year after year after year. And I guarantee you that this school year will be no different. Every single year in youth ministry, you have a class that graduates. And they graduate out of youth ministry. And every single year, it's, listen, I would love for somebody, anybody to prove me wrong. But I've been watching it every single year for the last 30 years of my life. Every single year, there's a class that graduates out of youth group. And from that group, 
a small number continue to follow the Lord. And there's always a group that graduates. They were at the camps, uh, all of Chris Amaro's dumb summer camps and tents, uh, his weird winter camps that he did. They were at the Mexico trips. They were at the pizza parties. They were at the Nerf nights. They were at the games. They were at the da-da-da-da, all the other things. And after graduation, they separate from the group, and they're off. And you, what are they off for? It's amazing. You know what they, you know what they go off for? They go looking for these curses. They go looking. They go, you know what? I grew up in a home with godly parents, two full refrigerators, had clothes, I had shoes, had a car, went to the mall, shopped, church, youth group, camps, all the events, all that stuff. But I just feel like there's something better out there. And they go looking for these curses. Now, they don't know. They don't, they don't leave and go, you know what? I think I'm going to go find some curses. They don't do that. They leave thinking that there's something better. See what he said there in verse 47? Because you did not, he's telling them, if, if you're disobedient, all of these things, these curses are going to come upon you. Because, why? Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart. You understand what he's saying? He didn't say, because you didn't serve me perfectly. He didn't say that. He said, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart. And then look at this. For the abundance of everything. In other words, you were not thankful. And that's what happened. Those are the people that go astray. Your fellow students that are sitting around you right now. Not everybody in this room is going to continue to follow after the Lord. They look like they are right now, but what you're going to find out in the coming years is that they, they, they actually didn't. They were here right now because mom and dad came, so they came. And then they made some friends here, and so they kept coming. But you're going to find that some of them are going to split. And then you know what? You're going to see them. You're going to be like, hey, what, what happened to so-and-so? And you're going to be like, oh, yeah, right here. I saw his social media. I saw her social media. Yeah, man, this is what they're doing now. And, 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 and those students will become a story, and they'll say, like, Man, yeah, do you see what he's up to now? He's doing this, he's, he's doing, she's doing this, she's doing that. And they're not following the Lord anymore. And they're, they're gone. What are they doing? They're looking for curses. They don't know they're looking for curses. They're looking for something better because they were not thankful for what they had. They didn't look around and go, oh man, like, man, I got a full life. I got, you know, some parents, maybe step parents. Okay, but whatever, you got some parents there. And I had clothes and I had shoes and I had food and I had church and I had trips to the mall and I had education. I had all the stuff, but I don't know. I'm just, it's not really enough. I got to go look for something else. There's got to be something out there more fun. And they go out looking for that. And some of them never return. Some of them come back beat up, but blessed. Some of them come back. But I have seen people graduate. I've, I'm, in June, will be, I'll be, it'll be six years here. I haven't been here that long. Some of you have been here longer than me. I've not been here that long. But I saw it in the very first graduating class after I got here. And I didn't mess them up, okay? Don't say it. It's because you came. That's not why. No. And that first graduating class was a, was a, was a good, it was a big group. Zach Brown, one of our leaders, he was in that group. He's still here. He never left high school. That's why he's still walking with the Lord, because he stayed here, okay? But you can talk to him about his group of friends, huge group of friends. When I first got here six years ago, I, went, I heard that there was a high school home study at the Browns. I didn't know the Browns. So I just drove down there. I went over there. It was a Tuesday night. And I pulled up. I got out. I walked into their house. The Browns were not even around. I don't even know where the parents were. But I walked in, and it was just high school students all over the place, filled up that house. It was incredible. And I just came in like, man, what is all? I've never seen a, 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 a high school home Bible study this big. They were all over the place and they were studying the word and they were reading and praying together and worshiping together. Zach Brown was part of that. He graduated with that class. You talk to him. Ask him where all his friends are. Why is he here? Where are the rest of them? Not all of them split. But the bigger group did. You ask him. He can tell you. He can tell you what I already know. That every year there are people that come through and they're just, 
you know, they're along for the ride, but they're not really satisfied with all the stuff that they have, and they want to go out and look for their own stuff. And they go out there, and they get ripped off and beat up. And some of them get beat up enough that they come back. And I've seen some of them. Some of them come back. They've returned. And now they're here, and they're serving again. And they're like, you know, I don't, I'm not going out there again. You know, I'm, I'm staying here. Some of them learned less, and others have not. Others have not returned. Others have not returned. They're not back. They're still not back. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything, we've got to have a thankfulness in our hearts for the things that we have that we've been blessed with. He goes on to tell them in these verses that, hey, you know, you're, you're, you, same, same type of things, you know, uh, down to verse 52, you know, there's, you know, if you're, if you're disobedient, these, these, look at this verse 52, they shall besiege you at all your gates, these foreign armies, until your high and fortified walls in which you trust come down throughout all your land and they shall besiege you at all your gates throughout all your land which the Lord your God has given you. Again, besiege means that the army would come and trap them in their own city, cut off all of the supply, water supply, food supply. Verse 53, you shall eat the fruit of your own body, the flesh of your sons and your daughters whom the Lord your God has given you in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you. Wait, 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 what did we just read? What? That's, that's, I mean, what, what, what is that? That's got to be some sort of, uh, uh, you know, that's a picture of something. Let's read on. The sensitive and very refined man among you will be hostile toward his brother, toward the wife of his bosom, and toward the rest of his children, whom he leaves behind so that he will not give any of them the flesh of his children whom he will eat because he has nothing left in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you at all your gates. The tender and delicate woman among you who would not venture to set the sole of her foot on the ground because of her delicateness and sensitivity. It's the woman who goes, oh no, uh, that's, ugh, that's dirty over there. I am not even going to put my toe on that dirt because that's dirty. She's delicate. She's sensitive. It says that she will refuse to the husband of her bosom and to her son and to her daughter, her placenta, which comes out from between her feet and her children, whom she bears, her placenta. The birth sac, for those of you that do not know, babies in it. For she will eat them secretly for lack of everything in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you at all your gates. You go, what? What is he talking about? He's saying, he's, he's saying exactly what you think he's saying. He's saying that if you're disobedient, he's telling these people, he's saying if you're disobedient, it will get so bad that you'll get to the point where you will revert to cannibalism. You will eat your own kids and you go, please, who would do such a thing? I'm so glad that you asked. Because in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 24, it says, and it happened after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was, great, there was a great famine in Samaria. And indeed, they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver. And get this, one-fourth of a cab of dove droppings was sold for five shekels of silver. What were they doing with the donkey's head and the dove droppings? They were eating them. Then as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him. And she said, help my lord, O king. And he replied to her, if the Lord does not help you, where can I find help for you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? He tells her, look, there's, we got nothing. The threshing floor where the wheat would grow, the grain, we got nothing. The wine press where there would be grapes and wine. He says, there's nothing. He tells this lady, there's nothing. And then the king said to her, what is troubling you? And she answered, she points to the woman, this other woman. She says, this woman said to me, give me your son that we may eat him today and we will eat my son tomorrow. And the lady said to the king, so we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her on the next day, Give me your son, that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. And now it happened when the king heard the words of the woman, that he tore his clothes, and as he passed by on the wall, the people looked, and there underneath he had sackcloth on his body. He was repenting. It happened. 
what God promised, he said, listen, if you're disobedient, if, you had a choice, if you're disobedient, this is what's going to happen. It's going to get so bad that you will end up eating your own children because you will be so desperate. It happened. Lamentations 2, Jeremiah the prophet said, should the women eat their offspring, the children they have cuddled? He said, young and old lie on the ground in the streets. My virgins and my young men have fallen by the sword. He went on into Lamentations chapter 4 a couple chapters later. He says, how the gold has become dim. How changed the fine gold. It means nothing. The stones of the sanctuary are scattered at the head of every sea, street. The precious sons of Zion, <laughs> valuable as fine gold, how they are regarded as clay pots now, the work of the hands of the potter. He says, even the jackals present their breasts to nurse their young. But the daughter of my people is cruel, like ostriches in the wilderness. The tongue of the infant clings to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The young children ask for bread, but no one breaks it for them. Those who ate delicacies are desolate in the streets. Those who were brought up in scarlet embrace ash heaps. He went on to say in that same chapter in verse 9, Those slain by the sword are better off than those who die of hunger, for those pine away, stricken for lack of the fruits of the field. The hands of the compassionate women have cooked their own children. They became food for them in the destruction of the daughter of my people. The Lord has fulfilled his fury. He has poured out his fierce anger. He kindled a fire in Zion, and it has devoured its foundations. What God told them, what he warned them about, actually came to pass. You can read it for yourself. You can read it in the scriptures. You can read it in extra biblical accounts. The people ate, they were besieged, trapped in their own city, got so desperate. Jewish people, God's people, ate their own children. Verse 58 of our chapter here, verse 28, our chapter, verse 58 uh, of chapter 28 in uh, Deuteronomy says, if you do not carefully observe all the words of this law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious, uh, awesome name, the Lord your God. So that he's, he's making it clear. you got to fear me. And we'll finish here at verse 63 because this is key. It's confusing, but it's key. Verse 63, this is where we finish. And it shall be that just as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and bring you to nothing, and you shall be plucked from off the land which you go to possess. And we go, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I thought God was good. I thought, you know, he was he wanted to bless his people, his children. Like, what do you, why would God, if he's going to rejoice over the people to bless them, why would he also rejoice over them to destroy them and bring them to nothing? Why would God do that? Well, again, there's a, there's a principle there. It's not that God was excited about, ooh, all right, I've been watching these fools, and finally, They've been disobedient enough. I can hardly wait to kill them all. That's not, that's, not the, that's not what's being said there. Why would God rejoice? For two different reasons. One, because he would have the opportunity now to wipe out the wickedness among the people. But also, in the process, as a result of wiping out the wickedness, he then could bring new life. Ladies, it's like going to get your hair did. I go to the salon, and what do you do? Listen, I grew up with sisters, I've got girls. You're going, yeah, I don't want too much cut off, just the dead ends, dead ends, the dead ends, the dead ends. That's all I've been listening to, you know, all these years, the dead ends. Got dead ends, I gotta get the dead ends cut off. But you trim, right? You get the dead ends off. Why? Why do you do that? Because you want your hair shorter? No. Because you get the dead ends off and then the healthy hair, right? Come, come back and then, mm, and then, oh, man, oh, mm. Once you get the dead ends off now, woo, right? Coming in hot. Get the dead ends off. For us guys, same thing, you know, you go get your hair cut, you know, and whatever, and you know, you, you're excited about the way it's going to look after, after you cut the dead stuff off. You get a new pair of cleats if you're an athlete, or you get a new pair of, of, of shoes for whatever sport. And you know, when you first get them, 
You know, you got your cleats, you got your running shoes, whatever, and you just feel like, oh man, like I gotta be careful with these things, man, they're so nice. And you know, cleats are not cheap, man. You gotta spend a hundred bucks, you know, for the basic ones, you know, and you get your cleats and you're out, like out there on the field, like trying to be careful, you know, and, but, but, but then you realize you come to a point where, man, they're dirty, but that's what they're for. And then you're excited, like, let's get down. And then, and then you're happy to use those, those, those athletic shoes up, the cleats or the shoes. You're happy because you know that once you're done with those, there's going to be a better model coming out, right? There's going to be something else, something newer, something better. That's the idea there. It's not that God's excited just to destroy his people. He's excited or rejoicing in the fact that he will then wipe out, bring an end to the wickedness, and then he can bring new life. It's a pruning. Get the dead stuff off. It's a, it's a hair, it, you know, it's, it's a trim. Get the dead ends off. And then there can be new life. That's the idea. With the same biblical principle applies for you and I, because we are Christians, there are times when in our disobedience, God's got to discipline us, right? Because he loves us. And he disciplines us and brings that, that time of wickedness or disobedience to an end. And then what comes after that? New life. So it's not that God necessarily enjoys disciplining us. Like, oh, I'm so glad that Pastor Chris has been disobedient. I've just been waiting to discipline him. Hate that guy. He loves me. And when I'm disobedient, he can work in my life Cut that out painfully, lots of times. But then new life comes after that. Isn't that great news? Great news. It's phenomenal news. We never stopped being his people. They never stopped being his people. Even when all of these things came to pass and they got, they got so desperate that they ate their own kids, he didn't go, oh my gosh, that's so gross. I don't want you anymore. We started over end of that reign of wickedness and started over. And they would always end up being disobedient again. And that's how we are. That's us. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We don't. We're, we're so desperately wicked, but God is so very good. But we want to strive. We, we, don't, we don't want to be trying to figure out, like, oh, how can I be one of those edgy Christians, man, out, like way out on the edge? Like, how can, I, how can I be obedient to the Lord, love the Lord, but still, like, get as far away from him as I can? No. We gotta change the mindset and say, no, I don't wanna find out how far away I can get. What I wanna do is I wanna find out how close I can get. How close can I stay to the Lord? We wanna to strive to remain in his presence. Not trying to go find the, the outer reaches somewhere. I don't, out there is cursing. I don't want that. I want blessing. So you gotta make a choice. Father, thank you so much for today, for your word.